I got gotcha. you. Okay. All right. Ready? Yeah. What's up, guys? Josh here for the Lightest today, and I am here with Adam, who is the MI40 strength coach. Adam, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, I come from Missouri, and my primary background is collegiate strength and conditioning. And I worked in the private sector too, so I worked with as a consultant, and I worked with athletes. So my my area of expertise before maybe about three or four year ago, years ago when I moved to Florida is collegiate strength and conditioning. And the last university I worked with was uh, Southeast Missouri State University. I've done some consulting with uh, the Dodgers and the Cubs for baseball and shoulder health and such. Um, but I've worked with baseball, football, men and women's diving, basketball, soccer, all of those sports at one time or another. I've worked with athletes in there. So my background actually comes from a, a sporting background. And uh, in my own time as a hobby, I was into uh, bodybuilding, competed in bodybuilding. How long and have you done in bodybuilding? <clears throat> bodybuilding was, was, I guess I had like an average career, I guess you would say. Okay. You know, I, was, I was okay at it. Um, I competed in, I did a collegiate nationals. I forget the year. But it was the year Jason Hub won okay. a teenage. Okay. Yeah, that year he won. Um, I remember outweighing him in weigh-ins by maybe two or three pounds at the weigh-ins, and yet he looked 20 pounds heavier than me. So I knew something was, I was like, man, he's got it, I don't. Yeah. You know? Um, so then after that, I was when I was working with athletes, I was still looking for something to compete in and do. And it was just very natural. All my studies and all my research went to power and strength. So I just flew, just like just this nice flow transition to powerlifting. It just all kind of started to make sense to me. So as I was trying to get at athletes stronger and more powerful, faster, and putting some weight on them, the natural progression of powerlifting for me was very easy. Okay. Um, what uh, what powerlifting organization do you compete in currently? Currently, I would say more of my meal my meets would be in the USPA. Okay. But for the first three or four years of my career, everything I did was USAPL. And you were pretty good in the yeah. USAPL. Yeah. Yeah. I, I competed the, at the IPF level, um, and in the Midwest, the the USAPL is very popular. And uh, you know what the power that was 11 years ago when I started doing that, and in the original, people powerlifting has really just come on in the past past few years. Mm -hmm. Raw lifting. I remember my first meet going to, and I remember I think it was the only 181 pound lifter that was raw. Everybody was doing single ply gear. Mm -hmm. There may have been two or three others, but you know we have 15 lifters in my weight class. We only have one or two raw lifters. Yeah. Everybody was geared at the time, um, and so that. But in the Midwest, and that, that was the federation to compete in, you know, and that was the federation I did. And I think my background, even now today, but jumping in and out of federations, because I can do Raw United, I do Rum, do some invitation only meets, things okay. like that. Whatever your rules are, like when you, I've come up through that federation, I can do. Okay. Whatever your depth is, whatever your pause is, whatever it is, I have no, whatever the bar stiffness is, it doesn't yeah. matter to me. Okay. That USAPL background really helped with that quite okay. a bit. Awesome. So, being a power lifter like yourself and being a very high level power lifter mm -hmm. at that, how would you say that hypertrophy would matter within the strength training program? Okay, very good question. Yeah. Get this, yeah, so we get asked this quite a bit all the time. So, when you're training for hypertrophy as a power lifter, let's go back to my background of training an athlete in sporting form. The Russians would quote something like sporting form. When you are out of season, you get about as far away from your sporting form as possible. You do other things, mm -hmm. right? So it's okay for a football player to do some other things besides play football. It'd be really good for them and work some work differently, different work. So as a power lifter in the off season, doing hypertrophy training and bodybuilding style movements just makes sense. Every other sport does it. We're yeah. a sport for performance. So part of your off season, besides building volume, is you're going to want to retrain muscles and make muscles stronger and bigger. Because even during a meat prep, you can have very small muscles that will atrophy on you a little bit. Mm -hmm. People don't believe it. Trust me, like your rear delts will get smaller, you know? And within powerlifting and into a meat prep, the weights get heavy. You spend a lot of time on your passive structures, your connective tissue, your joints, things like that that you know you need you can inhibit muscles and down regulate them so bodybuilding type training in the off season 
is a huge component of what you're trying to do. You know, I'm going to strengthen. If I, if I want to get my quads stronger in the squat, yes, I need to spend time squatting. But maybe instead of squatting three or four times a week, maybe I squat once and I train my quads mm -hmm. doing some bodybuilding movements. You know, if you've ever done a meat prep and you yourself have done yeah. that sometimes after a meet, <clears throat> That, and I'll be the first one to admit it, after a meet, you're like, you know, the last thing I want to do right now is put a really heavy load on my yeah. back, you know, and I don't want to deadlift twice this week. I still haven't squatted heavy from the meet back in February. Yeah, and yeah, like that's okay. Still like... Yeah, still, and you, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty still sure like... your quads are fine, right? Yeah. Yeah, to go into some bodybuilding, you know, success leaves clues. So back in the day, the old lifters had to figure things out. They didn't have the internet around to mm -hmm. kind of mess their head up a little bit. So the older lifters, you know, Kirk Kowalski, after squatting a thousand pounds, when he would drive to the gym after a meet, or he would drive to work, I should say, he would go a different route so he wouldn't go by the gym. He wanted to avoid it, right? So we're not saying that you have to take time off, but the older lifters knew, like, hey, okay, after a meet, I'm going to go back in and do some bodybuilding style mm -hmm. training. If you look at Ed Cohen's programs, he did bodybuilding. He did back day, mm -hmm. shoulders. That's crazy, right? But he did those bodybuilding style movements in the off season. So would you say when prepping for me, like the last eight weeks is usually whenever you start to really get specific with just the big compound lifts and you really start to take out the hypertrophy movements, right after the meat prep, would that, was that when you would say the best time to throw those back in there? Yes. Yes. Yes, I would. And I actually been playing around quite a bit now that as the meat prep comes and we're doing those big movements, here lately I've been experimenting with actually keeping some of the hypertrophy movements in so you can still kind of feel muscles, mm -hmm. so still doing like a fly or some medial delt raises, but I tone the volume way down on them just to get a little bit of a, not even a pump, but a little bit of a feel to yeah. activation of the muscle. Just making so, sure everything's still clean. Yeah, but all of our work will go to that, um, to the com competitive movements, and especially the last four weeks, as you know, it may just be the com competitive movements only. Yeah. Sometimes, um, it just depends on how people feel. Right. I know um, when I was working with you for my last meet, um, the last five weeks, I mean, all I did was the big movements, and I literally by the end of that, I was so drained, I had mm -hmm. nothing else in the tank, and I yeah. just went home. Then there was nothing wrong. Like we we had ten weeks to prep you, but what I would have would have done differently, and now if we had a little more time is I most likely would have like on a squat day, you would squat and there's nothing wrong with going and hitting maybe a single leg movement light and mm -hmm. some leg extensions and going home. Leg extensions, yeah, they're great. They're fantastic for contracting your quads and not heavy, just contractions, mm -hmm. right? And you were, you were a little bit different than a lot of lifters and a lot of young lifters have this issue. Your squat stance and your deadlift stance were damn near the same. So to ask you to pull heavy singles and squat heavy singles in the same week, only three or four days apart, just for just the basis of like your pelvis and the musculature, you were beaten up. Especially with, since you used the wraps. We used it overloaded, the overload, right? Yeah. So you, you're squatting 600. You squatted 630, and then say, oh, okay, four days later, let's pull 600. Yeah. Your 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 lower body was not recovered. So it was vice of one or the other. You had to choose, right? Yeah. So. You learn every meat prep. Okay, so where does time under tension come into play? Um, within the hypertrophy as well as still with the strength training, how does time under tension fit into the strength training protocol? Okay. <clears throat> so time under tension for us. And that's kind of a loose term too. I mean, right. you have so many different types of time under tensions mm -hmm. people use, mm -hmm. like John Meadows. Um, he does, you can do time under tension with literally no weight on you and mm -hmm. still, Sandy says you can still get muscle growth from that. Then you have people on the opposite end of the spectrum who just believe in moving the weight up and down and that's all that matters. Yeah. And I, here at MI40, y'all are kind of like in the middle between that, you're like a good mix between both. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll just use my, an, a little bit of analogy a okay. good way to that. So uh, this is from Alan Watts. So with the way our industry works, Imagine that you're going to a concert and a symphony and you're going to hear Beethoven being played. And so you go to listen to Beethoven, you hear it being played in New York, and then you hear it being played in San Francisco, and you have a fine tune ear. You could definitely hear New York play it a little differently than San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You would hear a little bit different because it's their interpretation. You know, the conductor, he likes this a little more, this conductor likes this a little bit more. 
both sounding beautiful, but you can definitely feel the differences. It's their interpretation of what he wrote a long time ago. And he himself, maybe, it would sound beautiful to us, but if Beethoven walked in, he might go, not even close, yeah. if he could here. But, you know, this doesn't even have anything to resemble what I pictured in my brain. So, in fitness, we're taking some things, some information, and we're trying to give you our best interpretation of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, time under tension, it falls right into that category. You have people who are, who are always talking in absolutes, and that makes me nervous. When you talk like, this is it, that's the only thing that matters, I can give you research on this. No, there are people out there who can really hunt down research and are good at it. They will find an argument for anything you want. So I always say, well, the peer-reviewed research says this, and I'm, sometimes I'm like, that's a cop-out. Yeah. Like, you can give me that for anything. That's just an easy answer. The yeah. research doesn't say that, you know. But time under tension, all of that, mm -hmm. time under tension falls in that category. So even like Brad Schoenfeld has some articles on time under tension, and he's like moving the load, moving the load. When John Meadows is, you know, sometimes he's moving low, but he's like, I can create tension with yeah. no weight. So what's the right answer? Yes, both, okay? But <clears throat> time under tension, as far as a strength athlete's concerned, sometimes when they calculate volume, they forget time under tension. So all I'm calculating is I did this amount of weight for this amount of reps, and that's all that matters. When you actually go, if they would actually think about the time under tension and how it was done, and like tempo, mm -hmm. it's completely different. It throws off the whole equation. Yeah. No, the only thing that matters is the weight lifted out for a set of five or a set of ten. Does it? During that set, you just did, let's say, 800 pounds of work, and this guy over here did 800 pounds of work. Same. Yeah, same. He did leg press, you did squat. Oh, that's different. Yeah, it's different. But the volume's the same. You did 800 pounds of work, you did 800 yeah. pounds of volume. Different. Yeah, why? Because one's a leg press and a squat. Yeah, but why? Tell me why. That's just the easy answer. Why? One's more essential, more demanding, more complex. You have to be wired in. The synchronization to do a squat is far more complex than a leg press. Yeah. Both have benefits. So just calculating, I did, you know, 150 pounds for a set of five, mm -hmm. and that's my volume. Not entirely. I did 150 pounds for a set of five with a three-second eccentric and a two-second bars. All set of five. That's tough. Yeah. Totally different. So time under tension is critical to it. And you want to learn to start to understand tempos and what they mean. Mm -hmm. Because as a power lifter, when we do it, we don't do, when we calculate volume and stuff and in my programs, time under tension and load, that's what I change the most in your competitive movements in the off season. So if you don't know what a tempo is, I will have to explain or give you my big essay on how to even read it. It's just four numbers, but explaining what's going on. Yeah. You know, the eccentric component, the isometric component, concentric, and the pause at the top, if there is any. Mm -hmm. You know, that's critical for any strength athlete or hypertrophy athlete needs to understand that. It's more than just lifting a load. Yeah. It's just more than that. It comes down to the proper execution of it. Yeah. 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 You can lift. You can lift weights with muscles mm -hmm. all the time. And you know? like uh, whenever you like, I think you would agree here. If you're just focused on moving the weight up and down, up and down with no regards to actually what's firing, it can often lead to injury that way as mm -hmm. well. Because if you're starting to compensate, because say I'm in a squat, but I have weak hamstrings and I'm pretty much just getting a bounce out of the bottom, hoping my quads will kick in. Mm -hmm. When I get to a point to where I can't get a bounce out of the bottom, I'm not going to hit the lift, as well as it's going to lead to greater risk of injury that way. Oh yeah, absolutely. So right there you just, just, uh, just a great segue into active and passive tension mm -hmm. that we preach here. And uh, going down and, you know, people don't realize that going down to the bottom of a squat or a bench press or something like that, just because the weight moves up doesn't mean you use the muscles. No, Adam, in the bottom of a squat, your quads are on. Not necessarily, mm -hmm. not necessarily. So I'll give you uh, uh, like an example of that. If everybody in middle school had to do those terrible wall sits we talk about, and your coach made you just sit there and it was miserable, you could definitely easily sit there when he wasn't looking, sit down a little bit lower and relax, right? So you've taken the tension off your quadriceps and you've put it somewhere else. 
a lot of times you put it in passive structures and your connective tissue and your joints, maybe some of your hamstrings and your glutes, but you've definitely turned your quads off and you can sit there and he turns around and he would tell you to come up a little bit. And you're like, oh man, like, so that's the same thing that can happen into a squat. You can actually get to a position where your quads are deloaded. They're so stretched, they can be weak. You know, so you need to learn to fire your quadriceps out of the bottom of the squat. Pauses, things like that. Doing bodybuilding training. You know? yeah. Leg extensions, hack squat with a pause in the bottom of it. I mean, God forbid everybody do a hack squat, you should be power with it. It's unheard of, right? You know, well, I'm, I, I train my quads because I do front squats. But you could still, the same purpose, you could still be in your passive range of motion with inhibition. Or if you're a high bar squatter like myself, adding the front squat on the target, your quads isn't necessarily going to be any better than doing mm -hmm. the back squat. No, yeah. and you in your fry. Yeah. And your fry. There's a few people in the world that can, that literally can go from one squat to a different type of squat in the same workout. Dang. You know? Yeah. Tangerine. Yeah. And so, yeah, he's 1%. If every, you know, and he's a great lifter and a great guy and a great coach. And he's a great role model for the sport, but he himself would tell you that not everybody would squat the way he does and do his program. Yeah. You know, that's the strength. Is actually the best coaches in the world, even online, is they're looking at you and seeing what you need to do. Not everybody should be doing the same workout. That's his strength. He would look at you up and down and tell you what you need to do. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and back to what you were saying a little earlier about um, working with like the negatives, controlling the eccentrics and really getting into like kind of like pulling yourself down into the squat you would say that Milanchev is the greatest squat in the world yeah. correct and yeah. if you look at all of his videos that's exactly what he's doing yes. every single time he's controlling load he's not just letting it drop down hoping to get a bounce and popping right out he's actually controlling himself mm -hmm. pulling himself down making sure everything's firing and then popping right out mm -hmm. I would say it takes him longer to get down than it does to go up mm -hmm. you know but when with like he would almost looks like he's doing a geared squat, right? He's loading. And if anybody's ever squatting gear, you're pulling yourself down. So why wouldn't you do it in a raw squat? Oh, I'll pull myself out of position. We well, just don't know how to do it. Yeah. You know, you're just constantly dropping. So then you get into types of muscle contractions. So a lot of lifters, hypertrophy or powerlifting, they they're only getting like 33% of the results, a third. So you have the concentric contraction, the eccentric contraction, and the isometric contraction. So if you are not actively in the eccentric, it's a contraction, it's a load. You should be doing, you should be creating passive tension in an eccentric, in a squat. I'm pulling myself down and contracting. I'm not just letting go and hoping I bounce up. Mm -hmm. I'm pulling myself down. What people don't realize is that even in the research that you get what's called the myotactic response, the actually elastic component and it's actually, it's an active loaded stretch mm -hmm. or lengthening, but it's active, not passive. The literature states that, passive. So that they even use that in therapy. Here's your active range of motion in the hamstring. That's as far as you can get when I stretch you. But then when I grab hold and I pull you further, that's passive. That's inhibition. Everybody knows about the static stretch and muscle yeah. before you train. So don't, that's the same passive range of motion. So if I'm not actively contracting and pulling myself down into these good positions, and I just drop, instead of getting your like your muscle spindle and getting this myotactic reversal response, you can fire the Golgi tendon organ. That's not good. That's inhibition. Turns off. Displace the force somewhere else and hope that you know you have your antagonist muscles kick in, yeah. which could be compensation sometimes. So things start happening. You know, so an eccentric contraction, pulling yourself down in the off season, here's something, instead of squatting for sets of 10, squat for sets of five and have, um, you wanna build volume? Sets of five with very hard eccentrics. Mm -hmm. You can pull yourself down. A five second eccentric for a power lifter, even a three second, is horrible. It's horrible. But you, get, you learn to pull yourself down and stay in position and load and then pause it. You know, that's an isometric contraction and contract out of the bottom. Same thing with the bench press. Don't rest it on your bent chest. Mm -hmm. You know, pause it, have the load, and then press it up. No moment, and a pause squat is not, I'm not gonna pause and then go down and come up. It's there and, then and contract. Yeah. yeah, spend time doing that. 
that, you strength building, boom, boom. I don't care if you squat 500 pounds and you're doing that and the high as you get is 225, 275. You've made yourself stronger yeah. by actually training the three components of a contraction. It's not just like load and mm -hmm. volume. I need to do this amount of work to get better. It doesn't work that way. So how would you start to implement like training with the time under tension and adding the accessory hypertrophy work into a program? I know that's a really broad question. Right. It's going to be yeah. dependent based on person to person. Mm -hmm. Kind of like as a general rule, like would you slowly start to add it in or like how much would be too much hypertrophy work in a strength program? In, in like depending on where they're at in their competitive cycle. Say for like an intermediate athlete an intermediate in the off-season. In the off-season. So how much hypertrophy work would mm -hmm. I initially? Actually, probably quite a bit. Because yeah, so they got a lot of work to do, right? And their big three lifts, would you make them still continue about as normal? Or would you start to add in like the time under tension training? Yeah, program, that's... Adding in like the variations. Right the there, exercises. right there. So just to keep things simple, Let's imagine that I keep all three of your main competitive movements in the training cycle. Mm -hmm. But instead of maybe somebody's coming from squatting two days a week or three days a week, I might squat them in their competitive movement once. But here's what I do is I use the, that form, your sporting form, the competitive movement. And in the off season, I don't ever let you just do a normal competitive rep. I'm either making you pause it or taking a very long time to go down mm -hmm. that day. Okay, so you're going, well, my low bar squat with my wide stance and all that with three second eccentrics. And the percentage would be like, a, like the people would say when I build volume, maybe 60 or 70 percent. But instead of doing those sets of 10 or 8 with it, we'll do five. And we will work that up. Maybe sometimes if I'm watching, we'll work it up till the technical breakdown. Not grinding reps. Mm -hmm. You can have a rep that goes perfectly up and down, but when I see that it's wrong, that lets me know something that. No reason to go up in weight or do more work. Yeah. You know, at that point you're breaking down. So the competitive movements, you can still have your same setup, same grip, even if you want to arch in the bench. But I'm making you either with a very, very slow eccentric or pausing in your active range. And so sometimes, God forbid, that means people pausing their bench off their chest. So to the normal eye, they would say, Oh, that doesn't you're not touching your chest, that doesn't look like a photo press. There you go. Yeah. So be like the success, and he's a 700 pound bench presser, and he, like you have shoulder issues, there's nothing wrong. Do a spoto press. Yeah. Pause it off your chest in the off. That is hard. Yeah. Then you're like, well, what about my bottom? Let's do some bodybuilding movements. You can do dumbbells. Dumbbell press, my hands are independent of one another. I'll get greater range of motion and under control because I don't have a bar in between my hands. So the bottom part of my bench press, which is my pec, Learn to initiate a dumbbell press with your pecs yeah. and not your front delts. So that may mean for my bodybuilder, my power lifters, I'm sorry, we'll do a bodybuilding dumbbell press with mm -hmm. flared elbows. That's crazy, right? No, I'm not working on your bench press technique. I'm working on your chest, yeah. your muscles. Learn to use your you muscles. to activate. Right. Yeah. So they'll take their main movement and I'll do like pauses and eccentrics with them and then lots of bodybuilding movements. Okay. You know, extensions, curls, flies, oh. yeah, rear delt exercises, dumbbell presses, dips, single leg movements. Yes, single. And then regardless if you're in a, in a, in a gym, like whether you have a membership or you're just going to a garage gym, everybody can do something single leg. Single leg split squat. Easy. Yeah. Kettlebell, dumbbell, barbell, broom handle, yeah. your girlfriend, <laughs> whatever. You know, you can do that stuff. Absolutely. Okay, awesome. So... My next topic would be, how can a bodybuilder benefit from a strength training protocol? Okay, bodybuilders are fun. Yes, so say example, like me, when I came to you, I was only doing my body, I just came out of my bodybuilding prep, I was about three months after, I'm just only doing accessory movements, I haven't squatted mm -hmm. over like 375 in months and months and months, mm -hmm. but like when we started together, I still made progress. All my measurements got bigger. Mm -hmm. um, my arms did not lag. I mean, at the very end of the prep, when I wasn't doing any arm work, of course, they were a little flat, but mm -hmm. I mean, but everything else, like my leg size, it got bigger and I got stronger. So how can bodybuilders benefit from that strength training? When we, when, hypertrophy in bodybuilding is fun. Mm -hmm. And just at the sense of when you think of the students besides rep ranges and all that, that's an oversimplification of what's going on because you have to actually think of 
the internal chemistry. What, what, why, and like, what's happening to the cell and the structure internally, the chemical reaction that's causing hypertrophy versus a strength gain. And you have to, a bodybuilder, to get the success, they have to do everything. So they need multiple stimulus, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the why they're- They're like the multiple rep ranges. Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. So they have to have it, right? So a bodybuilder does need that strength training, and we're not talking singles. We're talking, you know, like a functional hypertrophy number of five, six, eight reps. Mm -hmm. For a bodybuilder, that's a low rep range. But you are recruiting the high threshold motor units. You're getting more electrical stimulation, electrical wiring to the muscle, mm -hmm. if you will. That's a crude, crude way to say it. But you're getting that adaptation that allows when I hate when I go back to my hypertrophy training, I can use that. I'm learning to recruit those high threshold motor units. You know, um, and I will say, like from a powerlifting standpoint or strength, where bodybuilders really miss out, they don't understand. And you already said it. You didn't really lack in measurements when you did your powerlifting prep. When you're training in those strength zones, now here, here's here's an idea, and here's what we even will do with Ben. That's Ben Pikulski. Yeah, by the sorry, way. Ben Pikulski. So, when you're training for strength in those sets of five and six, that on a low calorie diet, even to make a weight class or anything, or dieting for a show, the strength rep ranges, that stimulus preserves muscle mass. People understand that. It preserves muscle mass. So you didn't see, what if you saw anything decrease, it because you have a shift in fluid, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're doing hypertrophy, you got this sarcoplasmic growth, and you're getting a shift of glycogen storage into the muscle. So you're missing out on that. Not that your muscle got smaller. Basically, the storage units got a little yeah. smaller, right? The, the shift in fluid changed. But you really, you didn't get smaller. You won't lose muscle, you know, unless you did a strength training just only for a very long time. But you know, for doing a 12 week, a 12 week or a 10 week uh, block of training and strength, it's a pre it will save your muscle. Even in a low calorie environment, it will save and preserve your muscle mass. And actually, it takes a very, a very low volume of strength training to preserve what you have. So, as a bodybuilder, here's what's crazy: like, so, like lots of stimulus, and what we like to do with Ben, and he's so smart about it. If I'm dieting for a contest as a bodybuilder, and I have body parts that just lack. Everybody knows, like, die down and lose my lats, mm -hmm. or I lose my delts, or something like that. Think of the rep range that you're training it in when you're on low calories. If you don't have enough food, and you're trying to do hypertrophy training, and you don't have enough food to feel that, you're not gonna get hypertrophy. Yeah. So, sometimes people, you're like, well, besides not using the muscle correctly, right, not using an actual lat you grow, this is lat, this is not. I don't care how far back you go, this is not lat. Don't be fooled by that, that's not true. But besides not using the muscle correctly, you're like, you don't have a lot of calories and you're doing giant sets and drop sets and superset on that muscle. Mm -hmm. You're not, if you're not feeding it, it's not growing, it's getting smaller. Yeah. When you're like, oh, if I wanna keep, I lose my arms when I die for a contest, you would yeah, be better. you're doing a two hour arm workout. Right, doing, so. you would be better off to say, maybe you need to do fewer sets and you need to do something in that six to eight rep range for your biceps. Mm -hmm and stay there, have strength training. You're like a strength training number. That will preserve your muscle mass on that in that low calorie environment. And like a strength training at a higher frequency too. Yeah, why not? Yeah. And even if you don't have to do every workout, but bodybuilders need to learn to do or periodize their training. Mm -hmm. And so if they have, you know, they're training their arms twice a week or their biceps, they could have every, you know, one workout out of four, 20, do that as maybe a metabolic workout or more volume. I'll do sets of 10 and 12. But the other three are more geared towards like a strength training number of sixes and eights, something like that. They'll preserve their muscle mass. So bodybuilder and hypertrophy, when you're, especially in a low calorie environment, it's fantastic for muscle preservation, you know, during a low calorie environment. Mm -hmm. And you can, for you, for example, who, I'd hate to say it, but even when you're dieting, if you lost millimeters on your quads, it wouldn't kill you. Yeah. Right? So what for you, what I would do in a low calorie environment is you wouldn't have, you we wouldn't be using your quadriceps and doing like tons of strength training. Maybe we do strength training one out of four or five workouts for your quadriceps. The other, we'd be doing high volume lactate producing. Lactate equals growth hormone, IGF-1. When you create lactate, it goes through the liver, boom, the oversimplification, and growth hormone release. Yeah. Let's just call it magic. Magic, right? That's a simple. 
Lactate equals growth hormone. Let's just, that's very simple. So let's use those, and that's how we'll get the weight off of you. We'll get the fat off of you. Your muscles that you can maybe lose just a little bit, or it's hard, I would doubt that your quads actually get smaller no matter amounts of the volume that you train. Let's use those big muscles to produce tons of lactic acid on a larger percentage of your workouts. That's gonna get growth hormone, that's gonna get fat burning, that lactic state. So let's use those muscles in a low calorie environment because they can suffer and be fine. Mm -hmm. But man, I wanna keep my arms strength training. Is that kinda, it's a big splurge of yeah. information. But I think that bodybuilders really miss, miss out on that strength training protocol, especially on muscles that, that they lose and they die down. So a bodybuilder, why, they have to have this vast array of rep ranges and stimulus to get the growth that they want. Even when they're dieting, you can have certain body parts that are like strength, metabolic high volume workouts, strength, you know, what are you losing? What can, you know, what's, what do you want to bring up and you always lose when you diet down? Thanks for telling me my arms are small when they die out of my head. I appreciate that. Well, you did it probably. It's just, it's just <laughs> yeah. you got too big of arms that actually probably get in the way of your bench press and your, no, not true. You want a big bench press too, you better have big arms. Mm -hmm. It helps. Eric Spoto doesn't have little triceps. Same with the back. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Now, here's an interesting thing too, and I'll, um, like Greg Knuckles just came out on Strength Theory, came out with a fantastic article on the lats and the bench press. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a very good writer. I recommend reading anything that he puts out. Um, that's on strengththeory.com. And the lats and the bench press, like how the lats help you. And somebody like Chris Duffin, can you, he'll preach about how the lats help you. And Greg Knuckles is like, well, the lats are minimal biomechanically. Who's right? They both are. I was actually talking to Joe about this the other day mm -hmm. after I saw the article. Mm -hmm. I also saw uh, Boroshiko post some information that I believe they ran research over in Russia showing that the lats do have on the EMG graphs activity. Mm -hmm. I believe it was at the mid range of the bench. Mm -hmm. This is where they were the greatest. Yeah. So here, here is real simple. Real simple. And this, I feel very comfortable saying this. Do I use my lats in the bench press? Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but you better learn to use them, better train them. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing, whether you use them or not in your bench press technique or you're ever taught how to use them, it's the thing, what you're getting is the benefit of actually training them. So to actually fire a lat, you have got to learn to contract and stabilize and compress, uh, depress your scapula. So the benefit from your lat training and learning to depress my scapulas and pull them down Make sure that in my bench press, I'm not elevating. Yeah, it's going to keep your form in check. Right, it's so it's, it's a, a byproduct of it. Right, it's a yeah. byproduct of my training. So upper back and all that in positions in the deadlift and the squat and in the bench press, to say like that the lats don't work in the bench press, maybe, maybe for you, maybe not for me, mm -hmm. but I tell you what, we both benefit from training yeah. the lat in bodybuilding style movements. So the lat is a shoulder flexure. It does some adduction and internal rotation, but primarily it's a shoulder extensor mm -hmm. here. So this is lat here to here. I'm loading, right? So my bench press, I should be actively pulling down. So doing, having some lat strength is going to help that. But also a byproduct of learning to fire my lats and my training and use that, I can depress my scapula, which will actually pop my chest up. So here's another byproduct of lat training. So I learned to use my trap three, which actually pull my scapula down mm -hmm. and works with my pec minor. So I actually do this little chest up thing. That's not my chest. That's my lower trap pulling my scapula down. That's chest up. So when somebody in a powerlifting community says, chest up, chest up, chest up, I, could, I want them to just stop and say, now do you mean chest up like isn't can decom you know, depress your scapula, keep your upper back tight, or do you mean hyperextension of your low back? Yeah. Two totally different things. One is right, one is not right very mm -hmm. much at all. It's this squat like thing too, right? That Don't do that, don't look up. Don't do, no, look up. Your eyes move inside your head, you're not an owl. Yeah. Right, so you can look up without this. This is cervical extension, that's that's power output loss. Mm -hmm. But we're gonna, another, <laughs> sorry. That's for another video. Yeah, you can do another video on that. Edit for content time. But yeah, that I get from learning to train my back properly like a bodybuilder and activate my lats, the byproduct of that will equal pounds on your bench press.
this, regardless of who you use them or not. Mm -hmm. And nobody will argue. Chris Duff and anybody says last Shiko, nobody will say not train your back. Yeah. Rarely, rarely. If you do just say to work on your bench press, I would argue with them, even though they're better lifters than me and better they're great coaches and better coaches and they have world records, I would still say, don't just press. Dan Green does pull us with like three forty five saying you know, and like, you know, 150 pound dumbbell rows, maybe more. And just throws around like it's nothing. He's got big back. Yeah. Big back. I have, and I will say this, this is true too, like Jim Wendler one time, I think it was Jim Wendler, who said, I've seen guys with big arms and big chests who can't bench press heavy loads. I've seen guys with big legs and like big legs and big arms, big calves, who can't squat or deadlift heavy weights. I've never seen a guy with a big back that's not a big, you know, like they are not yeah. strong. You know, you can see guys that you can have guys that are good. Some of the list they have a little back. They're gonna be lacking something. Prime example too in the bodybuilding community, Ronnie Coleman, uh, Dallas McCarver. Yeah, they're two of like the strongest freaks, mm -hmm. and they have the most massive backs. Right, think of, and they row a lot of weight. Right, they can do pull ups and pull downs with a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. Very strong, and we pro we really work here, and you've been here. We really harp on people's backs yeah. because what people don't understand too is that in the back, um, and I just, and he's a great lifter. This isn't like even John Meadows, you would say that's his lat, no, that's his teres. Mm -hmm. So that mass right underneath the armpit, then you're, what you're seeing a lot of times is teres. The lat like goes underneath the teres and it just like, kind of flares around the outside and goes in the front of the arm. The lats are really low. If you ever want to look, like look at public pictures of Ronnie Coleman and flex wheeler on their backs. You will actually see the lat, and you'll see this division, you'll see the lat come up, and you'll see this, this nice separation for their terries. Mm -hmm. People lack that, because they don't actually know how to use their lats, and they pull into you. You know, they just go pull right into that lumbar fascia. So that's just a whole nother, we could talk about lats all day. But like I said, regarding Chico, um, even Mike Tashir, you know, he's a big presser guy. But the byproduct of lat training is crucial. Yeah. Everybody needs it. Regardless if you use them in your bench press or not, do it. Back training, face pulls, lower trap work, not upper trap work. You know, like, oh, well, you do shrugs. No, I deadlift. Besides, I have a hard time coming up anyway, and I don't need any extra help doing that. I'm trying to stay down, yeah. you know? Stay down, so. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Adam, I appreciate the time. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Um, I really do thank you. And I did pay Adam for this in donuts, by the way. Uh, Krispy Kreme. <laughs> but, yeah, um, if you want to go ahead and actually tell us your best list, um, I think people would be interested in knowing that. Okay, so at, um, at 181, my best list, I have a 633 deadlift, a 601 squat, and a 413 bench. Okay. So those are in my meet. And on a side note, we'll talk about as a coach, and we could go on about this too. So those are my best meat lifts. I actually pride myself in calling lifts at a meet. It's what you can do for a day. So yeah. as a power lifter, you can do all of this prep and hit these PRs, but you have to think about it. It's all of that training, regardless of what you do, is to prep what you can do for that day. So what we did is try to chase world records. But we'll fix that next time. Yes. Yeah, that's next coming time. in the future. Yes. So in your next training, we'll actually shoot some videos and a thought process of each block of training that you go through. Awesome. All right. And the announcement for me will be coming soon. Oh, good. Yeah. Not awesome. my weight class. <laughs> no, one idea. <laughs> I like to eat. Yeah, and I don't want to compete against you. Awesome. Hey, it's been a pleasure. No problem, man. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you.